Ladies, uh, gentlemen, friends, colleagues, you're all very, very welcome. Um, my name is Jane Olmeyer, and it's always my privilege to chair uh, these wonderful uh, events tonight in the Thomas Davis Lecture Theatre here in Trinity. I'm welcoming everybody who's in the auditorium that we are trying to live stream. It didn't work last time, we're hoping it's going to work tonight. So if you're following us online, you're extremely welcome indeed. Uh, as I say, my name is Jane Olmeyer, and I'm the director of the Trinity at Long Room uh, Hub, which is our research uh, institute in the arts and humanities. Now, here we are on the eve of International Women's Day, uh, and we're really delighted to be partnering this evening actually with Liverpool University and the Institute of Irish Studies. So, Lauren Arrington is our representative from Liverpool. Anybody else in the audience from Liverpool or Liverpool graduates? No, one day. Great, delighted. You're very, very welcome. Um, and uh, our discussion this evening uh, explores if and how the position of women in society has changed over the century uh, since women finally gained the right to vote. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, before introducing you to our fantastic uh, panel, I, I just want to remind everybody what it is that we do in the Trinity Long Room Hub. Um, we support the excellence uh, of the research in the arts and humanities. We promote multi and interdisciplinarity. And this evening we have a lawyer speaking, we have a literary specialist speaking, we have a, a, an English scholar uh, speaking, and Susan, actually you're in literature uh, as well. So it's a, a loving mix. Um, and the final thing we do is public humanities. We want to take the learning of the arts and humanities to the widest audiences, both here in Dublin and across the world. Um, this is part of our Behind the Headlines uh, 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 signature lecture series or discussion series. And we're extremely grateful to the John Pollard Foundation, uh, who very generously uh, uh, funding uh, supports uh, these events. What we're very keen to do is, through our discussions, is bring um, uh, complexity to uh, these issues and to explore that from the perspectives of the arts and humanities. Um, but we want to do it in a very respectful way, um, uh, and one that, as I say, embraces nuance and combats oversimplification. And this is, I think, one area where it's very much uh, in the headlines, and I think having uh, uh, the wider context is, is, is incredibly uh, important because, as we know, on the 6th of February uh, 1918, the Representation of the People Act was enacted in the United Kingdom, giving approximately 8 million people in England, uh, Wales, Scotland, and here in Ireland the right to vote, including after decades of campaigning by suffragettes, uh, uh, six million uh, women. The century uh, has been, uh, sorry, the centenary has been a cause uh, of poor celebration um, and I think it's particularly appropriate that we're having this on the eve of International uh, Women's Day. Um, but also the sudden eruption of the hashtag Me Too movement around the world in the last few months has brought into the spotlight the question of just how far women have advanced uh, towards equality in uh, uh, the past 100 years. Really lucky this evening to have a fabulous uh, panel. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, each of them. And the order I introduce them is the order that they will uh, speak. So Lauren Arrington is a, a senior lecturer at the Institute of Irish Studies in uh, uh, Liverpool. Um, and she's director of the Yates Summer School, or was between, well, 18 19, uh, uh, she's director. Um, Lauren also has been a visiting research fellow at the Trinity Long Room Hub, I think twice now, Lauren, is that correct? Uh, so I feel she, I'm playing here as one of ours. Um, she, she's just written a, a wonderful new book on Constance Markovitz, of course, uh, uh, the, the first female minister, um, uh, and somebody who we're enormously proud. Uh, and it'll be an aspect of that that, uh, that Lauren is going to explore this evening with us. Our next speaker is Deirdre O'Hearn, um, who is in our law school here in uh, Trinity. Um, uh, she uh, has spoken and written extensively 
on Irish uh, 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 corporate uh, law, and she is uh, particularly interested in looking at um, how women are represented uh, at the decision-making table in, in business, uh, but she's also very concerned about gender representation on uh, corporate boards. Our third speaker this evening probably needs very little introduction because he's our much loved Dean of Arts, Humanities and Social Science, uh, Daryl uh, Jones. Uh, who uh, is also um, an expert on uh, popular literature, Jane Austen and horror. One of the most entertaining lectures you can ever attend is Daryl when he's talking about horror. It really is. But tonight, actually, Daryl is wearing more of a university uh, uh, hat, and uh, he will address the hashtag uh, Me Too uh, um, discussion uh, uh, in the context of uh, uh, harassment uh, in the uh, universities. Now, it's a very critical moment, I think, here for universities, as well as other institutions, as they undergo this process of self-examination and self-realization. And as I say, uh, uh, Daryl will talk about that. Then last but not least is Susan Cottle, who is a um, professor in the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University in Montreal. And we're very lucky that, that Susan is with us this evening, but she's actually a visiting research fellow at the Institute of English Studies in the School of Advanced Studies uh, in London. So uh, she's over to do uh, this this evening. But also she's speaking uh, tomorrow night, and I'll actually come back to that in a moment, but let me just tell you that uh, uh, her research interests Irish women's writing, Irish girls, literary uh, cultures, uh, and uh, young adult fiction. And this evening, she explore the role of personal testimony and the politics of storytelling in feminist activism in Ireland. But I should also say, Susan is speaking tomorrow night at the launch of a wonderful new exhibition in the library called uh, Story Spinners, and she'll be talking. Uh, uh, about a, a history of wild Irish girls. Now, it's already fully booked, but maybe you know you can squeeze in, but if not, it'll be podcast and hopefully live streamed as, as well. Um, the format for the discussion is as it always is. It's a nine minutes, each of our speakers has nine minutes. And those of you who've been here before, we're very strict about that. Um, uh, and then we'll open the door to questions where we're really strict, so I'll come to that in a moment. Um, we would love you to join us. Obviously, put your phones on to silent, but do tweet if any of you are tweeters using that, the hashtag #HubMatters. It's uh, here up on the screen. Um, we are being live streamed this evening, so again, everybody's aware of that, uh, and um, it's going to be particularly important in the Q and A. But I'll, I'll come back to that after we have heard from uh, our first. Uh, so, Lauren, without further ado, uh, uh, over to you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you all for coming along this evening. Me Too is the 21st century manifestation of at least a 100-year history of women using alternative forms of media to campaign against sexual violence. The rapid technological advances of the 19th century led to a democratization of the press. There was a simultaneous increase in demand for inexpensive newspapers and magazines as new readerships were grouped around new movements and causes, most notably a new working class readership. This momentum carried on into the early years of the 20th century and was harnessed here in Dublin by the Irish Transport and General Workers Union in its newspaper, The Irish Worker, and by the suffrage movement in the newspaper, The Irish Citizen. This pattern of technological innovation going hand in hand with campaigns for social change, as we've experienced in Me Too and Repeal the Eight, is the latest iteration of a centuries long pattern. The newspaper, The Irish Citizen, launched a bold campaign against the sexual assault of women and young girls that was occurring across Ireland. The Citizen indicted the mainstream press for its tendency to sensationalize violence against women and its failure to report assaults accurately. For example, an article titled Irish Girls' Peril 
was on the front page of the Irish Citizen on the 3rd of May, 1913. And it focused on an attack on three young girls in Limerick when one of them was bound and gagged. A passerby heard the girls' screams and interrupted the assailant before the girls were assaulted any further. In its report, the citizen charges the mainstream press for reserving, quote, its leaded type for dastardly outrages of suffragettes on unprotected golf greens and empty mansions of the rich. It can find only the callous appellation of exciting incident or attempted rape. The citizen's rhetoric is powerful, using the phrase leaded type to depict mainstream reporting as a weapon used against suffragists. Moreover, the citizen charges the mainstream press for using the word outrages to refer to the activities of suffragists. In its contemporary context, outrage was a euphemism for rape as in the phrase, she was outraged, which encodes both the physical assault on the person and the emotional response of the person who was assaulted and her associates. The use of outrage was common in the 1910s and the 1920s, and we even see it in police reports from the Irish Civil War about, about the rape of women. In its campaign, the citizen targeted the Irish independent in particular. And here, I think we can see an overlap between the suffrage and the working class leaderships, since the William Martin Berkeley owned independent was also frequently targeted by the Irish worker. The third of May citizen article is referring to a piece in the independent from the 24th of April, headlined, Young, Sol Young Solicitors Plucky Act. It begins with the line, the independent article. An exciting incident occurred at Ballinacara Limerick on Tuesday evening. The independent names the assaulted girl in full and gives her age, but the article is ambiguous as to the identity of the assailant. It says merely, the prisoner whose name is Walsh has been romantic. No age and Walsh can be called the name. The naming of women in press reports contributes to shame, stigma, and one can infer would be an impediment to women reporting crimes against women. <coughs> the citizen sometimes details the age of young women and girls who are assaulted in order to underline the severity of the crisis. Uh, some girls were assaulted, um, uh, who were assaulted were as young as six years of age. The citizen never discloses these girls or women's identity. By contrast, the sensational reporting in the independent valorizes masculine heroics and reports on rape as an exciting piece of gossip. That article, Young Solicitor's Plucky Act, concludes, the incident is the general topic of conversation in Limerick, and Mr. Moore's plucky conduct is widely praised. Giving further attention to the language used in mainstream reports of sexual violence, we can see the frequent recurrence of the word exciting. The same word was also used to refer to women's activism. So the 2nd of May, 1913, Irish Independent, just days after the report on the assault in Limerick, there's a report on a suffrage meeting that's given the subtitle, Exciting Incident. The mainstream media's co-option of a word with sexual connotations in its contemporary usage to describe suffrage activities has the effect of allegorizing women as the aggressors, positioning them as responsible for the violence enacted against them. So I'd like to conclude by summarizing some of the Irish citizens' activism. It's important here to highlight the pioneering work of the scholar Louise Ryan, who brought to life the work of the Watching the Courts Committee, a committee of women who attended proceedings on cases of sexual violence in order to give detailed accounts of acquittals and what they regarded as the unjust sentencing of assailants. These women had to fight to be present in the courts in the first place. When they were there, they took detailed notes and published their findings in the citizen. Again, protecting the identity of the women and children who were assaulted, but naming the assailants, including assailants who had transmitted venereal disease to the assaulted persons. Again, some 
of the girls who contract the disease as a result of sexual assault for as young as six years of age. The Irish citizen persistently advocated sexual education, the use of accurate terminology, and the abolition of euphemism in order to fully address the crisis facing women in Irish society. It emphasized that if parents were to educate their children about sex, the children would at least be prepared um, for the need to protect themselves from assault. When the citizen ceased publication in 1920, women had the vote, but it would be another year before women, including Marion Duggan, who was uh, the founder and chairman of the Washington Courts Committee, could practice law and sit on juries in the trials of men who had assaulted women and children. So we can see that activists in the 1910s and 20s are instrumental to women gaining visibility and participation in civic life. Yet we still observe today the media's reports on sexual violence that give attention that centers on the assaulted rather than on the assailant. And this is where I think Me Too's campaign to put a name to the act of rape and to name rapists is making some of its most important impact. I think it's interesting that when Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, was asked why he had created a gender balanced cabinet, his response was three words because it's 2015. Clearly, he thought that commitment to gender equality required little justification in the 21st century and was pretty much a no brainer. Until everyone else catches up, there will continue to be a chasm between legal guarantees of equality and the lived experiences of women in our world today. I think it's significant that the extension of the franchise to women was hard won and often required militant means. And when it came, it didn't come on equal terms to men's entitlement to vote, an imbalance that wasn't rectified until 1928. While men over 21 could vote, women had to be 30 and had to satisfy other requirements in relation to education, marriage, or property ownership. In assessing the contribution of law, it's relevant that rather than equal treatment being extended eagerly on a plate to women, many of the subsequent legal uh, changes over the last century have been hard fought battles against discrimination. Undoubtedly, this idea of equal treatment of women being a concession or privilege has contributed to a view of women as subordinate in status. Let's look at women's participation in the workforce through the lens of law. There's some ambivalence out of our 1937 constitution, uh, which stands still today. On the one hand, it contains an equality guarantee guaranteeing the equal treatment of citizens before the law. On the other, it continues to contain a strikingly retrograde article recognising the special position of women within the home. Unfortunately, that mentality that women belong in the home was far more than simply a rhetorical flourish. The marriage bar introduced by Aidan de Valera's government in the 1930s was the ultimate act of sex discrimination, where women were forced to give up their public sector jobs upon marriage. That inequality foisted upon women a huge impact on women's participation in the workforce over the four decades. On a positive note, it's worth acknowledging that Ireland's membership of the EU meant that from 1972 on, the EU's champion of socio-economic rights led to forced legal change, including comprehensive legislation on employment equality and maternity protection. Nonetheless, there are still cases arising year in, year out, in relation to discrimination against pregnant workers and women returning to work after maternity leave. This suggests a less than optimal buy-in by our society to living by equality uh, and fairness at core values. Many legal advances have been made over this century that are worth celebrating. But, and it's a large one, in 2018 there is still a pronounced disconnect between how our law values gender equality in abstract terms 
and the reality of how gender decision making continues to play out in the form of considerable gender violence. Although the suffragettes were firmly focused on their catch crime, votes for women, the bottom line is that simply giving women the same rights as men is not enough. I guess my take home message is that law may assist for changing norms, but it's not going to be the answer. That's because gender equality requires norms to be internalised by a society as well as being externalised in law. In the absence of that buy-in, there are marked uh, inequalities in everyday experiences of women who really are not likely to go into court every time they feel the affront of the inequity of being treated differently than their male counterparts. This raises the spectre that women are equal in name only. My point is that law on its own is good, but not good enough. Legal change also needs a society to change, and vice versa. Let's talk about the gender pay gap. <laughs> Unequal pay was part of the courts in 1918 for women who worked. Today, Despite the principle of equal pay being enshrined in law, there is a 14% gender pay gap in Ireland. That meant that last year women were working for free from the 17th of November on. <laughs> As we speak, you know, this is not just a, a notable concept. Tesco, in Tesco, the women uh, on the shop floor are taking a £4 million equal pay claim uh, against Tesco because they're being paid three times less than their predominantly male counterparts in the warehouse. So we're still stacking shelves in both locations. Also in the newspapers, it's been reported that Emma, Emma Stone um, of La La Land fame uh, has come to some agreements with her male co-stars who've agreed to take pay cuts in order to afford her pay equality. And that was portrayed as, as some kind of victory. Over at the BBC, uh, Carrie Grace, who was China editor, you know, resigned in protest uh, for unlawful pay discrimination. And following on from this, six of the highest paid uh, <coughs> presenters in the BBC agreed uh, to take a pay cut. For me, this type of leveling down phenomenon is problematic as a means of achieving equality. Uh, essentially, it's a zero, a zero sum game whereby, for a minute to gain, men must lose. And ultimately, the overall net change as well is zero. Perhaps more fundamentally, it's, one of, it's objectionable because um, it doesn't require employees to do anything, employers to do anything, they're off the hook. Uh, instead of having to make changes and uh, embedding equal treatment as soon as the way things are done. Could the law do more to uh, address pay discrimination? Well, speaking in 1913, as someone ahead of his time, perhaps. Uh, Justice Brandeis in the, in the U.S., uh, later to be the U.S. Supreme Court judge, um, said that sunlight is the best disinfectant. What he meant by that was, if you bring undesirable practices out into the open and to public scrutiny, it's amazing how efficient it is at cleaning up. <laughs> in that vein, legally mandating transparency around pay then uh, could make uh, companies' decisions uh, more objectively justifiable. In fact, gender metric reporting is beginning to take off in other countries, and in the UK from next month, larger countries are going to have to report on their gender pay gaps. Iceland has taken things a step further, and their companies uh, from the 1st of January this year have to be certified as equal pay compliant or risk a criminal offence and a fine. And that's designed to completely eradicate their gender pay gap by 2022. All of this highlights the need to, to get women to the top table where decisions are being made. As you all know, there's been huge interest in the subject of uh, women's representation on boards over the last number of years, and the problem of boards being pale, male, and male. <laughs> Sometimes some good old uh, fashioned activism, the spirit of stuff gets worth a treat. Uh, in 2012, when Facebook announced that its IPO was coming and that its board would be uh, all male, there was a pretty big backlash. Ultraviolet, uh, a group of uh, women's activists, gathered 53,000 signatures to their petition, uh, seeking a woman to be added to the board. 
basically listens. And whatever effect we're leaning in, this push is what actually led to Cheryl Sandberg's elevation to the world of Facebook. This brings me to the big debate on quotas. Norway led the way on this by introducing um, a quota that's very tough in terms of requiring listed companies to have 40% women on their boards or face warnings, penalties, or the ultimate pulling of the plug in terms of delisting from the stock exchange. A number of other countries in Europe have followed suit. Of course, quotas are controversial. However, whether you love them or hate them, it's incontroversial that they plainly work. Statistics show that when a quota applies, progress in improving a frankly woeful rate of women's participation uh, is immeasurably different than would be left in free market. Having said that, quotas do not address the problem of companies making token appointments of one or two isolated women without integrating equality or diversity as a core value. Clearly, hearts need to be won as well as minds. In conclusion, laws building upon the 1918 Representation Against the People Act have played an important role as an agent of change. Yet, despite major advances to remove discriminatory practices, gender equalities persist. One of the reasons that we're still playing catch up is that laws may often prove irrelevant to the daily lives of everyday women, where either conscious or unconscious bias presents itself. Boardroom and gender pay gaps reveal a society which has not fully internalized gender equality as a core value, even where the law supports it. A paradigm shift is needed. As tonight shows, it would be a mistake to underestimate the power of the Me Too movement as a force for change. Its ripple effects have the potential to blast open outdated mindsets and to radically recalibrate the equality set point. To paraphrase Justin Trudeau, Trudeau because it's 2018. <laughs> Thank you. In February 2018, news broke that Cambridge University had received 173 complaints of sexual misconduct since the establishment of its anonymous reporting system nine months previously. This was an aspect of the university's Breaking of the Silence campaign, which had been instituted in large part as a response to student concerns. Cambridge publicly admitted to having a significant problem with sexual misconduct. Other UK universities, such as Manchester, have established similar reporting systems. The At Me Too PhD hashtag has brought to public attention hundreds of episodes of sexism and sexual harassment in universities, including in the behaviour of students towards female lecturers who report often being judged on their looks and who regularly receive less favourable student feedback than male colleagues. Universities are not the only institutions to be undergoing this process of self-examination and realisation. News also broke in February 2018 that the UK Parliament was instituting a crackdown on harassment and bullying after a survey revealed that 20% of Westminster staff had experienced or witnessed sexual misconduct, and 39% have been the victims of bullying. This is a critical, if not an existential moment for universities and other institutions. Universities are particularly vulnerable to issues of sexual misconduct. We have lots of young people. If we're being honest, we have to realise that universities have historically performed many functions, and one of them is as a kind of dating agency. <laughs> Marriage markets. I met my wife <laughs> when we were postgraduate students. A university is also an institution in which there can be significant imbalances of status 
uh, knowledge, say, between older male staff and the younger female colleagues or students. I have no reason to believe we in Trinity are any better or worse off than other universities, but I think that this is an issue which has the potential to affect all universities very profoundly. We can't pretend this is not happening. What are we going to do? In thinking about and preparing this talk, I spoke to many friends and colleagues, mostly women, about the Me Too movement. I got a wide variety of responses. There is no consensus. There is no one answer to this. The only thing I can say, and perhaps this is the only substantive point I have to make here tonight, is that we have to talk about this. We have to have an open, frank discussion held in good faith about sexual misconduct in universities. We need to recognize that, as in Westminster, this discussion may spread out to related issues of bullying and other abuses of power. University management has to participate in this discussion. But most importantly, it has to listen. The most practical piece of advice I got uh, from discussing Me Too with friends uh, was that men have a habit of interrupting them when they're talking. <laughs> and we should be doing this. It's a, it's a matter of power, and I, I really hate it when it happens to me. I know for a fact that some UK universities simply would not permit a conversation like this take place in any official way as it deals with issues of sexual inequality and of sexual violence and of the relations between the two. There are some universities in which tonight's event would not be allowed to happen. Sadly, in our world, we know a lot about cultures of silence. Whatever the answer is, it's not that. Do I think the Cambridge's anonymous hotline for reporting sexual misconduct is a good idea? Yes, I think it probably is. But the real question for me is what do you do next? Here in Trinity, we do have a very good dignity and respect policy, and I want to publicly endorse it now. Anyone who is the victim of sexual misconduct or other or sexual harassment or other misconduct should immediately go to the College tutor, if a student, or their immediate live manager in the first instance of the member of staff, or one of the college's designated contact persons. In saying this, I have to acknowledge that, of course, due process is important, and I would urge anyone who is a victim of harassment to immediately to talk to a contact person. But it's easy to see why a young female student or lecturer, for example, might be very reluctant to go through a protracted and painful formal complaint and disciplinary process of perhaps ambiguous outcome against, for example, a senior male professor who may well be in a position of power and influence over their future career. People need to feel confident that they will be supported by the university's structures. But certainly, the Cambridge student agitation that led to the breaking of the silence campaign grew in large part out of a widespread distrust in the efficacy of internal discipline procedures. They just didn't seem to work. This kind of impossible situation is exactly why the Me Too movement has gained such momentum. A feeling that systems and structures of law, discipline, and justice are inadequate to the lived reality of the situation. In the UK, the National Union of Students Women's Movement has proposed that disciplinary cases arising out of allegations of sexual harassment should be judged on the balance of probabilities rather than on a criminal standard of proof. In practice, I should say that this is how Trinity's investigation system also works 
a judgment made by an investigator on the balance of probabilities after speaking to all sides. Lola Olufemi, Cambridge Students Union women's officer, has written of, quote, the need for a profound culture shift in the ways we, we teach, learn, and use university space in relation to sexual harassment and violence. If I had the answer to this, or anyone did, we'd be talking about something else tonight. But we can start by publicly naming the problem. In getting involved in this discussion, we have to recognize that we will get lots of things wrong. And we have to hold our nerves when we do. I've come to believe that humanity is psychologically incapable of assimilating the developments of the internet and social media at anything like the speed we need to in order to keep up. Online culture has led to an exponential increase in what sociologist Stanley Cohen called back in the 1970s folk devils and moral panics. When we make mistakes, we need to acknowledge them. Sometimes we will say the wrong thing or a well-meaning thing, clumsily, as I may well be doing tonight. But we need to take part in a conversation with integrity, without being afraid of the consequences when we do get things wrong. To close, to begin to close, sexual harassment is often permitted by power imbalances. So, I would venture that one practical step might be to reduce the power imbalances. In universities, what I mean by that is that there should be women at senior levels in positions of power and authority. Straightforwardly, we need to create more women. I've long been a believer in affirmative action or positive discrimination when it comes to promoting women, though I know most people disagree with them. But still, only about 34% of the women's of the university's professors are women. So we can't say there isn't a problem. So this is an issue of protecting the vulnerable from the powerful. Promoting more women would certainly help do this. But in arguing for this, what I wouldn't want to do is to replicate the frankly masculinist competitive culture of women. <coughs> we need to be a more thoughtful university. Universities need to be more thoughtful. Universities are, after all, the places where we say we hold up society's values to critical scrutiny. Where we say we teach young people about the virtues of civilization and the responsibilities of intellectual citizenship. But it isn't good enough simply to say these things. We have to live by them. We have to say we don't do these things. We can't offer a model of it as if we cannot offer a model of the civilized society. One in which victimization and the abuse of power should have no place. And no one can. Thank you very much. from writer Ursula Le Guin, who in 1986 gave the commencement address at the University of Bryn Mawr. Um, so she was addressing a room full of young women and told them, we are volcanoes. When we women offer our experience as our truth, as human truth, all the maps change. There are new mountains. And so it's this weight of voices and impact of voices that I want to consider here, and I want to talk about Waking the Feminists and the Repeal the Age Movement. As you all know, in 2015, in response to the programming for the 2016 Abbey Centenary, Waking the Nation, which featured 10 productions, one of which was written by a woman, set designer and arts manager Leanne Bell launched a campaign calling for equality in Irish theatre. Theatre director Mae Stone coined the hashtag Waking the Feminists. It was, as Bella said, something that she and her friends had talked about in private. It was not a conversation that had been had 
in Irish theatre in public. Bell has noted the outpouring of voices, personal testimony and stories that flooded from Irish women. And support also followed from celebrities such as Susan Bowman and Meryl Streep. The public meeting in November 2015 that sold out in less than seven minutes featured 30 women on the Abbey stage, each with a slot of 90 minutes, 90 seconds, recounting their experiences. As freelance curator Rosha Gowan responded on social media, I can't say how relieved I am that Waking the Feminist has finally given voice to the experiences of so many women in Irish theatre. Thank God we are finally talking about it. The campaign lasted a year and it led to real and substantial change. The Abbey listened and produced a set of guiding principles, including making gender equality a permanent board agenda item. And this, as Bella's noted, had put the Abbey at the vanguard of change in relation to gender equality in national theatres. The Arts Council commissioned research into the statistics and their report was published in June last year. Members of Waiting the Feminists are now on the Abbey Board and the Arts Council. For Bell, one of the major results has been the normalisation of this type of conversation around gender representation. Before Way to the Feminists, as she recounts, this was almost unspeakable, especially at the organisational and public level. So the feminists were awake and they were talking. The end of 2015 was also significant for women's voices, as in September, journalist Roshan Ingle and actress and comedian Tara Flynn both told their personal stories about their experiences being forced to travel for an abortion. Their personal testimony sparked further stories of women's experiences, including my own, powerfully rerouting a formerly shamed silence into compassionate calls to listen, to trust, and to empathize. Una Malali's crowdfunded anthology of literature, personal stories, and art on Repeal the Eighth Movement is currently in press, and that's due for publication this spring. Facebook groups, and websites like In Her Shoes and Everyday Stories are featuring personal testimonies of women's experiences around abortion. The Exile Project is a gallery of women who have been forced to travel. Grace Dias and Emma Frazier's performance piece, Not at Home, is set in the waiting room of the clinic and features women sharing their experiences. Of course, we know from the important work of second wave feminists that the personal is political, that stories of personal experiences can have broad ranging effects, both in their ordinariness and in the extraordinariness of the fact that they need to be said. Michael Jackson, anthropologist, not the singer, <laughs> <laughs> writes about the politics of storytelling. When one tells stories, he writes, one is never simply giving voice to what is in one's own mind or in one's own interests. One is realizing or objectifying one's own experience in ways that others can relate to through experiences of their own. So in other words, storytelling and personal testimony are means of connection. And in this connection, it means of forming community. And this has been a profound effect of Waking the Feminists, Repeal, and Me Too, the ways in which allies have been identified and communities have been forged. Stories make us seen and make us heard. Re-energized in 2012 with the establishment of the Abortion Rights Campaign and the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth Amendment in 2013, the campaign has also been helped not just by voice, but through visual aids. Anna Cosgrave's repeal jumpers have been instrumental in bringing this community into visibility. We can now actually see each other, hear each other, and because of this can stand together. Jackson continues, stories disclose not just who we are, but what we have in common with others. What is remarkable since Me Too, since Waking the Feminists and New Developments in the Repeal Campaign is an increased platform for women's voices and stories. And an increased visibility for this activism. What was extraordinary for me was 
Leo Varadkar's press conference, in which he announced the government's backing for a referendum to repeal the gate. Particularly, his language, which echoed the language of the repeal campaign and the language of the personal testimonies of women who had travelled, and in which he explains his changed attitude to the fact that, quote, above all, I listened to women. The Citizens' Assembly also acknowledged the importance of hearing women's voices and experiences in their recommendation to reveal the aid. I told my story for exactly this reason, as well as to connect to the thousands of women who were forced to travel and whose stories we are hearing. Roshan Ingle and Tara Flynn's stories gave me permission to tell mine, and I wanted to contribute to that permission giving. The more voices, the louder we become, the less they can ignore us. This conversation is far from over, though, and there is much work to be done. I know how hard it is simply to have conversations about repeal with friends and family and strangers. When friends spoke to me about my experience, an interesting thing happened. I noticed that some of them couldn't actually quite say the word abortion. They were whispering it. They were almost afraid when it was appearing in their mouths. But that time for silence is over. We need to erupt, to change the landscape in Ireland. Have difficult conversations in order to make connections, in order to create empathy, and in order to bring about change. As poet Muriel Rukeyser writes, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. Thank you. to our four panellists for insightful um, and uh, very moving, very erudite talks. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a really good discussion uh, around these issues. Then they're all very disciplined with their time. So oh, we're, I'm going to invite you, as I always do, to keep your uh, questions brief and direct. Um, we don't need speeches from the floor. It's actually not the forum to share personal experiences. It's really to focus on the bigger issues and, uh, as I say, keep the questions uh, brief. Bear in mind also that we are being live streamed. Uh, could, as you ask a question, you could indicate your name. I think that's very helpful uh, for the panelists. And as I say, uh, uh, keep those questions uh, uh, brief. So uh, is, is there somebody at the back who had their hand up? We, we have mics. Please, if you just over to you guys now, any questions? We don't have any? I can't believe that. Here we have uh, uh, one here, please. Hi, uh, Nora Bird from there. Um, uh, I wanted to ask Deirdre, um, there seems to be a lot, particularly online, of kind of alt right commentary saying that the gender pay gap is a complete myth. In terms of these kind of different arguments where people say it's not a given, what, would, what do you have to say to? Some of those arguments that are made. Thank you very much. We have another question. We'll take a few. In the middle here. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Martha. I wanted to ask what do you think would be the significance of the loss of the reveal movement? Um, so it's the victory of the same gay something on the community and kind of like essentially started with the movement. So the question is, if, if, if the referendum was lost? Yeah, if the referendum is lost, like what, yeah. what effect would it have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Like, I, not even, I can't even begin to contemplate that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you showed, thank you. Like Brexit wasn't going to happen in my world. <laughs> <laughs> Neither was President Trump. Um, anyway, one more question. Um, there's a, a lady here in, in purple. Even it might be easier at your end, just is coming here. And then we'll return to our panel, please. I just like to say, if the personal is political, I don't think personal stories should have to be excluded. But my question is, so your name, Glenda Chimino. Glenda. Um, my question is about how do we actually change the power structure? Mm -hmm. As has been said, putting women on boards is a good thing, but it seems to me that wherever you have hierarchy, you have power imbalance and you have bullying. As a matter of fact, and I'm wondering what can be done about this to rearrange the way in which we structure our organizations to eliminate hierarchy 
Thank you. Like, great question. And again, that might be all the panelists might want to come back to that. So why don't we start with the gender pay gap, uh, uh, Deirdre? But if anybody else wants to come in on that, but it's quite it. Yeah, uh, uh, Mike's coming back to you. And then we've got Martha's question on repeal and, and letters. Let's, let's start with that. Okay, so if I get this right, so you're saying you all right by saying that the gender pay gap is a, is a myth, is that what the government is? is? But unfortunately, in kind of Facebook yeah. kind of arguments that they yeah. have various kind of then saying that there are different measurements. Everybody's experience is, is different, right? But it's an average, I suppose, you take it as, as that. I guess the argument you most often hear is that women's participation in the workforce is different and often fractured, and that, that is true. Um, at the same time, I mean, we have to say, as I mentioned, the Constitution values women's special position in the home uh, and it says that it, it is absolutely needed uh, in order for childbearing, etc. Yes. The government doesn't put its money where its mouth is and, and actually put in tax breaks for childcare or anything. So, I mean, you can argue over where the statistics are right or wrong, but I, you know, that, if I, if that's, you know, that's just a, a wall. If, if someone just doesn't want to accept a pay gap, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum uh, had a report last year which said it would take 115 years if we left the world to itself to actually put the, the global gender pay gap to rights. And um, so, I, you know, that's uh, a report on every country that's out there, um, and it's like 15 years, so I think that's all I can, I can say to that, is that I think, I think it's pretty hard evidence out there. Although, of course, individual women, uh, in, in may be good at negotiating and may well uh, have, have different experience. It's an average. Deirdre, when you've got the um, mind, do you want to say anything about uh, changing power structures? Or changing either yeah. of them, yeah. yeah. Well, in relation to changing power structures, um, we're always going to have hierarchies, but what I, I did say, I suppose, was that we do need women to be at the decision making table. And if we look at, say, our, our representation of women in, in terms of, of, of the law, in the job we have at the moment, 22% uh, representation of women. And uh, in the cabinet, 20%. So, you know, women uh, are not a minority. That's the worst thing you hear. Women are not a minority. We're not a minority. We're half the population. So, if we want things to change, we need to start at the top in terms of, of representation at the legislature. And quotas, as I say, they are a way of achieving change. Uh, and that, that is one way of, of equalizing representation in a quick way. Uh, uh, even though, as I know, it's it's a rather uh, crude way of achieving it. Do you want to pass it up to Lauren and then we'll maybe work our way down? Please. In terms of changing hierarchies, I think we have to think about identifying what's the most effective use of social and political capital. So if we look historically, real political change has happened when people with capital in the public sphere have advocated on behalf, on behalf of people without capital. So you look at the demographic of most suffragists in the 1910s, people like Constance Markovich, are middle class and upper class women who advocate on behalf of the working class. Right now, I think we see mostly women often speaking for their own interests. And I think we need to see women with political capital speaking in an informed way on behalf of the interests of others. Mm. Thank you. Do you want to come in on this, Daryl, in, in terms of, and then we'll come back to the field. Yeah. Um... Yes, uh, if, if I knew how we could change the power structure <laughs> um, and, and eliminate hierarchies, and I'm always going to have to go to do, do that. Um, but, but what we can do is, is, is mitigate and help. And for me, I think it, it, it's a combination of, of old fashioned liberal values of, of openness and fairness and discussion and representation uh, and equality on the one hand. Uh, with uh, a recognition of the necessity of, of coercion and of civil disobedience uh, on, on the other hand. Um, uh, that, that, that's why I said uh, that, that, that I believe in, uh, in the action I do believe in, 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 in quotas, because uh, uh, power doesn't change of its, of its own accord, you know, um, and it often can't be persuaded to um, uh, change, but it can be caused or shamed into change. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come in on, on, on this one, 
Susan. Yeah, I guess I would just echo the comments of all my panelists. It's absolutely a question of representation. And it's absolutely a question of people with the power um, taking action, as Lauren said. Um, nothing is going to change without either of those two things. Um, do you want me to address the... Well, would you, uh, absolutely, if, and then the others can join yeah. uh, 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 in. So the question about the effect um, on the community of the loss of the repeal um, would be devastating, mm -hmm. obviously. But the campaign is really strong, really active. Um, Alba Smith, the wonderful Alba Smith said today, if that happens, we will absolutely keep fighting. We've been fighting for a long time and will continue to. So while there might be an initial setback, I think there will also be a re-energization caused by that frustration and anger. Because anger, as we know, is a great catalyst. Mm. Anybody else want to come in on that? No. Deirdre? No. Um, uh, okay, we will come to you now, but I'd like to come back to the structural issue that um, I think it was uh, Glenda raised. I think for me the other issue there is I chair the Irish Research Council and we're always collecting data. Uh, 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 and uh, one thing that we do is we um, have all of the evaluation of postgraduate uh, applications done gender blind. You don't know if that is a man or a woman. And we've done that now, I think, four years. And what it demonstrates is there was effectively unconscious, let's be fair about it, or conscious bias uh, against women. So when we started to do evaluation gender blind, um, the proportion of women succeeding in arts, fancy, social sciences in increased by a fifth. In STEM subjects, and science, technology, <coughs> engineering, maths, by nearly a third. So, you know, what is that telling us? And I would just also point people to the great work that the Higher Education Authority is doing in this space uh, and they're holding universities to account in terms of setting uh, very clear milestones that have to be achieved in terms of uh, a greater uh, diversity and, and equality. Uh, and again, going back to the research councils, um, there's an insistence that each university will have a fee on accreditation by 2020 to be eligible to receive uh, any sort of research uh, funding uh, from any council in Ireland. And to my mind, it's the stick in the carrot, you know, uh, uh, but, but anyway, um, let's do another round of questions. Hilary, I think you had your, your uh, wait to the microphone, please. And then there's one at the very back. Um, and this was just really a point responding to Susan, where if um, they, it happens where the referendum fails, and she mentioned Tara Flynn there as one of the women who gave personal testimony. And she talked about that and she said, if it fails, we might not be out again the next day, but we'll be out the day after. Because this isn't about a debate, it's about a wrong that has to be made right. Thank you. At the back. And there's one here as well. So keep your hand up so she can see you. Just can you get in there, Francesca? Right in the middle. <laughs> Sorry. And then I think it's going to be two or three rows in front of you. There's another question. The other lady, I think there was another question here. Oh, it's over here. Okay, please go ahead. Your name? Hi, uh, I'm Alan of Thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, uh, the conclusion uh, I drew from, from all your talks is that uh, the power imbalance of the institution comes from uh, gender stereotypes, the stereotypes about masculinity and femininity. And also, speaking about sexual harassment, uh, most of the abuses are men, the majority of the abuses. So, uh, I think it's crucial to educate people on gender stereotypes. And the Is that your question? If you could phrase it as a direct the question. question. Is coming just now. So here is my question. <laughs> Ideally, we, could, we should educate people before university. But my question is, what uh, initiatives, actions can be taken at university to educate young people, especially uh, if, um, encourage men to participate in discussion about gender stereotypes? Thanks, Annette. We just move it on. I'm very keen to get as many questions as possible. The lady here again. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caroline Sheen, and um, I have a quick question. It goes back then to the whole structure of power. There was women who identify power was different from men. And that is it. That, so women will put off the backward bending curve when it comes to power as there is to work. 
for women if they will retract from the society and from what you're looking to is sorry what's your question my question is this if you're looking at gender imbalance and you're looking at the structures the structures of home are inherited from a council council understanding where women were, were never given a human voice mm -hmm. so we have to look at where, where do you start you start at, at an educational level Okay. And the awareness, where do you come to awareness okay. along the stages? Thank you very much. Have we had another question? Uh, I'll say Claire in the middle here. And then we'll come back to our, our panel. It's a question for Daryl. Um, I know from my years of experience as senior tutor that, as you say, students are very reluctant to make their complaints official. So they will go to the contact people for support and advice, but making the step of making a formal complaint is extremely difficult and very few of them would do that. So what changes do you think we need to make to the disability, the dignity and respect policy to change that? Thank you, Claire. Daryl, we'll start with that and you can then comment on the other two as well as very closely related questions there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I understand uh, Claire's question, absolutely. Um, what, what, uh, what changes could we make? I mean, one of the things that, 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 that I think we need to recognize is, is, is that um, uh, uh, Sometimes these issues um, can be resolved informally rather than formally. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know? um, but where we're talking serious issues of sexual harassment, yes, I, mean, I, I genuinely don't know the answer. I, mean, I think the, the conscious thing is your respect policy is it, 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 it's a very good document, as I said. It's it, it's the um, it's the encouragement of students to go through a process, uh, and, and um, uh, this is where the the the, the, the Me Too uh, movement is really comes out of. Uh, I think um, that uh, uh, this is where uh, Cambridge's idea of an anonymous hotline um, uh, might help a lot. The, 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 that this can be, we can begin to get a sense and, and people can begin to air their concerns uh, confidentially in that way. Um, but I can well see that, and, and, and we see that everything from disciplinary processes to, to God forbid, rape trials, uh, how ghastly uh, these occasions are for the victims, uh, is what I've been the moment. Um, so I, I, I don't have the answer to that one, I'm afraid. Um, uh, but we we can't say to we can't discourage you from the moment. But we have to make sure that they're supported um, and, and, and encouraged to do so, and that the structures will work to support them. Um, in terms of education and how to educate our students, for example, um, uh, out of gender stereotypes uh, and, 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 and out of inherited versions of gender behaviour. Um, one of the things that I've often thought the universe um, that we could do with is, is a compulsory course for all of our students in their first year irrespective of what subject they're doing in ethics. Uh, and this could cover a variety of things from professional ethics to, um, uh, to business ethics, to personal ethics, to sexual ethics, to philosophical ethics. Uh, and I think to, um, uh, to introduce um, our, all of our students, whether they are, uh, whether they are philosophers or, or mathematicians, or chemists, or medics, um, uh, to the notion of uh, education as a form of ethical citizenship. Um, that's the best answer I can come up with. I was going to say, lots of nodding heads there, Deirdre. Um, a few things occurred to me. Um, I think 
Jupiter for the most of them. Yeah, it, it is a question of well, everyone that we can model, right, or that we're looking for from cradle, right? So it's mainstream, I suppose. The UN is doing very interesting work on, on gender, and they have a very interesting project where they've got 10 CEOs, 10 prime ministers, and uh, 10 universities as champions in this area. And one of the things that, uh, that they're doing the same things, but then they also have to come up with their own targets. And one of the universities in America has set up a, um, a center that, for masculinity and, and the study of masculinity. And that's something that we sometimes forget in this, that we also need to think about men and the, the stereotypes that we have of men, strong, not crying, um, you know, this sort of a rugby sort of type, or whatever it is, that we also need to think about supporting men. Uh, so that sort of aspect too uh, of thinking about changing stereotypes for everyone, for men, women, that in between, whatever way you identify, is something that is a conversation that we really need to have. Um, in terms of, 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 other, of other aspects of this, in our university here, we do actually take uh, gender uh, very seriously, and, and, in, and in all commissions in the university, we do have uh, we have a quotas for men and women. But what's been a really good uh, progressive development of late is not only do, does anybody on the interview panel have to take uh, special training against unconscious bias, but the people who are most commonly on interview panels in the universities, so people like Daryl, etc., they now have to do one to one um, uh, training against unconscious bias so that we really do root this out. Uh, and make a difference because we all come at, at things with, with inherited ideas from fairy stories we read from whatever, and it's something that we all should need to work on, I think. And you know, it's not it's not just saying what do we do, what does someone else do. It's what we all do. Mm. Uh, does anybody want to take on the structures of power? I think it's Caroline's question. Um, but, but obviously, I, I'm not suggesting you have to. But if if, if you want to. Um, uh, Susan, or you want to come in on what's being said already? Well, well, I think maybe I'm going to come at that through commenting on what's been said already because yeah, I think some of the ways that we change power structures are through education at a really early level. Like, I am not a primary school teacher, I have my experience teaching at the university level, but we need to be having these conversations at that level as early as possible. Um, I read about people having conversations about consent with primary school children, not using the word consent, but you know, that thing where the boy pulls the girl's hair and you explain to him by saying, oh well, that means he likes you. That needs to stop. Those things, you, you, nobody, you, you talk to primary school children in ways that, that they have control over their own body. So that, happens, that needs to happen, that needs to happen really early. Um, I absolutely agree about the fact that we need to talk about the way in which gender stereotypes hurt men as well. Often when we're talking about gender stereotypes, we're thinking of gender women. So that conversation absolutely needs to be broadened. Um, then what I wanted to say about um, encouraging, or at a university level and beyond, in terms of people coming forward to talk about sexual harassment, I think one of the things that's really important for people to come forward and talk about that and to go public about that if they want to, is the sense that something is going to happen. The sense mm -hmm. that their voices aren't going to go into this void and it's all just going to disappear. Um, so that really needs to start to change, that people feel like their voices have an effect. Mm -hmm. Coming in on what Susan is talking about um, with regard to educating primary school children, um, some of the courts, uh, some of the cases of uh, sexual assault were dismissed in the courts because um, teenage girls and uh, young girls under the age of 10 didn't have a vocabulary to describe what had happened to them. And so the, the plaintiff's testimony was dismissed. And there is a, that's a, the, the message behind the citizens' campaign of sexual education is that until we have vocabulary to talk about these things, we can't begin to rectify them. Mm -hmm. Let's do another quick round of questions. Okay, so I was going to say there's a cluster in the middle here. So we'll, we'll try and add, so, so, so Melton, then Nora, and then there was another person here, and this lady, and then that's it. And again, really, really sharp to the point so we can fit four in. Well, actually, 
Okay, my, my is not a question, just a follow up to what you have said about education. I think uh, we should also have workshops for the male pale and the male. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. That's, that's quite important. It's, uh, we need a workshop for men in power. Thank you. And then we'll pass it back. So my question is, do men need to take bullying? Thanks. Do men need to take action to protect themselves in the workplace? I would just say that I've come across a few people where they um, unconsciously are passing comments that may be considered inappropriate, but it wouldn't have been their potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And then Nora behind you, Nelson. And then this lady here, and then we're done. Please. So I um, just want to direct some of the worrying, more worrying aspects of the Me Too campaign, which has been a sort of significant, as you say, backlash with groups such as which comes to being brought around in the media. I'm just wondering how, as a community or indeed as an institution, do we deal with such criticism that we've gone too far? So obviously, we can just start it. Thank you very much, Lauren. And then just pass it over. Hi, I'm Melody. I just wanted to ask that you think that the Me Too movement is an attempt by women to create their own history, which poses a threat to the masculine historiography and how we study history in the academic discourse, because it brings political story to the forefront, which is completely excluded. Thank you. I don't know, who'd like to begin? Right, so Laura. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Just one quick point. I think in this conversation, I think we have to be really careful to remember that men are not always the assailants. When we talk about men protecting themselves against cases of assault, men are also sometimes subjected to assault, and women can be assailants as well. And so we have to be very careful with these stereotypes that men um, pointed out earlier. I think we also need to be careful as a lawyer in terms of due process and trial by social media. I think I'm most said about that, but it, that, that's part of the backlash as well as saying you know, people deserve a right of reply. So, it, it, it's, it's something that we need to be conscious about. Do you want to, I was going to say, do you want to come in on anything else? See, in terms of, do you think things have gone too far? I, I think we do need to be conscious of, of boundaries, but uh, everyone has their own decision on what, what's too far and what's not too far. I think the point being made about women coming in telling their own stories now, yes, and that's what fits in very well with the narrative we've heard tonight uh, uh, from, from the other panelists here, that yes, they still tell women to tell their own story. And just because women are telling their own story doesn't mean they're always right either. So let's, you know, let's, let's be conscious that uh, people people may go too far telling stories, and sometimes they're not telling true stories too. So it's it's more nuanced, and we need to be aware of the nuances. Susan. Um, I suppose in response to the question about the backlash, every movement like this has had a backlash. Um, so one of the things that we can do is kind of have a historical look over the ways in which these kinds of movements have happened and how the backlash has manifested itself and the ways in which we can um, answer that. Um, <coughs> no, nobody else? Well, yeah. Yeah, well, I, mean, I was going to say, we're starting to wrap things up. Does anybody just want to have any sort of final comments or thoughts? Sorry, you've got the microphone in your hand. I don't know if you want to say. <laughs> uh, uh, because I, I think your words tonight were very powerful and very welcome. Um, but I don't know if there's you've anything to add. If you don't, don't doesn't matter. Well, um, just, just on the issue of, 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 of the backlash, uh, and I suppose the related one uh, uh, in, in the way of, of, of men protecting themselves. Um, do I personally uh, think uh, we can swim too far in our uh, But I recognise that others do. I think this is where the importance of, of a university being a space in which we can have an open discussion um, uh, about uh, these issues it, it, it is, is, is very important. The recognition that there is there is no consensus, that there are a number of, this is ferociously common, on which there are a number of perspectives, uh, and we need to hear a variety of, of, of voices um, without shutting anybody down, without demonizing. Um, one, one of the things that appalls me most, I, I, I think, um, uh, about the, the alt right was mentioned earlier on, is the way in which freedom, the issue of freedom of speech, has become, seems to have become, an issue of political right. 
this is the political right who talk about freedom of speech. I think I, I, I think those of us who are not of the right need to need, need to reclaim this this notion of freedom of speech and, and need to assert the university as a space in which this happens. And so the, there will be a discussion. There will be profound disagreements, but then that's that's okay. That's kind of what we're here for. Lauren, I think, wants to get in there. Well, there's some uh, wonderful uh, historical models of how I think to go about um, achieving success. Um, one of those models is to look at the intersectionality of Irish feminism in its early years. You see the Irish citizen, for example, making the link between poverty and domestic violence, poverty and mental illness that leads to abuse. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that we absolutely need to keep at the forefront of, um, of like the feminist community today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Susan, Deirdre, final words? I absolutely don't think that Me Too has gone too far. I think we need to keep talking. Um, these voices need to be heard. Historically, we haven't been listened to. So this, the energy of women speaking, of people telling their own experiences in a climate in which um, those experiences um, have been changed and have been silenced, I think that's absolutely important. That energy, energy needs to keep going. That's a really nice note, actually, on which to finish, because I think for me tonight it's just been fabulous. I mean, our panelists have been amazing, um, but also obviously great questions. There's a lot on this evening and a lot of audience, uh, I mean, um, competition for audiences uh, in Trinity and across Dublin, because of course it's International Women's Week. These sorts of talks are going on across uh, uh, the country, never mind across the city. So it really is great that so many of you came, that you've participated uh, uh, so fully. Um, and I'd like to thank you for that. I'd like to thank my staff for doing um, an amazing job uh, uh, organizing these events. Uh, but above all, I I'd like to thank our panelists who, as I say, I think have really brought so much uh, to the discussion. And the message coming away from this evening is uh, uh, obviously it's the beginning of a conversation, uh, but it's a conversation that really is only beginning. And clearly, 100 years on, well, we have moved on. And I think that's where Lauren uh, uh, was so valuable in terms of, in a sense, reminding us just how awful it was back in, in 1918. Uh, we've come a huge way, but by God, we've got a long way to go as well. So, anyway, let's thank our speakers in the customer. Room.